Good morning. Welcome back to Salem Lutheran Church and School in Afton, Missouri. It's Sunday morning, 9.20 a.m. Central Time, and time for our morning Bible study. My name is Pastor Wayne Hebner, and with me this morning is Vicar Brett Jones. Working the video behind the scenes and fielding your questions on Facebook is Mr. John Whitmayer. Today we continue our Bible study, Stress and Worry in the Life of a Christian. And as we did two weeks ago, we're going to try something different in the alternate weeks of this study. We'll do a case study from the Bible and learn how God's people can be prepared to serve as we learn from the Old Testament book of Esther. We'll be uh, spending a lot of time in Esther chapter 4 and 5 today as we uh, look at Mordecai and Esther uh, for our case study, but let's begin with an opening word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit upon us to open the words of the scriptures for our understanding and the increase of our faith. We thank you for the example that you give us in your servants Mordecai and Esther, and as we see how you prepare them to serve in their vocations, help us also be prepared to serve you and your people in ours. We pray that you guide and direct this study to the glory of your holy name. Through Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Well, welcome, Vicar Brett. Good to have you here again this morning. Thank you. And, it's great uh, to be here. Thank you for joining me. Uh, we're going to do a kind of dialogue Bible study, as we did two weeks ago. Now, let's go back and set the stage a little bit. Uh, we're going to start with the welcome uh, uh, sign on the screen. And if you're watching at home, you'll be able to see these slides. We welcome also those of you listening to this study over our telephone ministry. We know you can hear the audio stream of what we're saying, but you don't have the benefit of looking at the slides or on the screen. So I'll try to read uh, most of what's on the slides so that you can at least get a gist of what we're talking about. We're going through this uh, study from Lutheran Hour Ministries called Stress and Worry in the Life of a Christian. We are living in unsettled times, and at the beginning of this study several weeks ago, I identified the three things that I think are causing a lot of stress and worry in our society. First, of course, is the COVID pandemic that has affected virtually everyone in some way, and some in dramatic ways, creating a lot of stress and worry in our lives. Then there is the social unrest as we as a society grapple with issues of social justice, uh, policing, uh, law enforcement, and so on. And finally, we have elections now in less than a month in the United States, and you can hear the uh, volume of the rhetoric on each side moving higher and higher each day. This too causes a lot of stress and worry in our lives. So if you look at this welcome slide that we've been using each week, it says we face daily pressures and challenges, work schedules, bills to pay, loved ones to care for, and so on. If you look down at the bottom of that slide, it says the way we handle our stressors influences every aspect of our lives, and so does the assurance that our Heavenly Father comforts and cares for us through every hardship. So that's the background to this study. We thank our friends at Lutheran Hour Ministries for providing it for us. Now we're going to continue our look uh, in the next slide at the introduction. It says exploring stress and worry, causes, effects, and strategies to manage them. That's the focus of today's case study, Stra strategies to manage the stressors in our lives and use them in certain ways as we serve our Lord and his people. We pray that God will share with us the peace that only Christ Jesus can give, uh, that peace that is too good to keep to ourselves. Throughout this study, we've heard video messages from our friend, Dr. Rick Mars, who teaches here at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. We won't hear Dr. Mars today, but he'll be back uh, joining us in next week's session. So if we go back to last week, uh, we had the third session, Prepared to Serve. We learned that each of us faces stress and worry in our vocations or callings, and with our Lord's help, we can learn to identify <clears throat> limit and manage stress in our every vocation. Identify, limit, and manage. Now today we're going to look at a case study from the Bible at two of God's people 
who learn to identify, limit, and manage stress in their vocations. Their names are Mordecai and Esther. One of the suggestions I received from one of our seminarians is that we put out questions for you to think about and to which you can respond as we go through this study. Many of you are watching live on Facebook and we welcome you to submit comments and questions uh, in real time. Mr. Whitmere will uh, relay them to Vicar Brett and me and we'll do our best to answer them. And to prime the pump, so to speak, to get you thinking, uh, I wanted to share with you some questions in advance. We'll return to these later in the hour. But uh, think about, as we read more of Mordecai and Esther, how are their stressors similar to yours? In other words, do you have similar things going on in your life, or have there been times in your life when you face the things that Mordecai and Esther did? Second, how can you limit or focus your stress in a similar way? Can you think of ways to limit the stressors in your life and focus them in a way that is positive and constructive. And then the third question will be on that verb, manage. How can you manage your stress in a way similar to that of Mordecai and Esther, especially in your vocations? We talked a lot about vocations already. These are the callings that God gives us in our lives. They overlap and are layered upon each other in our homes, in our workplaces and schools, and in society in general. So how can you identify, limit, and manage stress in your vocation? And then the last question that we'll wrap up with today at the end of the hour is, how can the Lord use you to serve his people and witness your faith in your Savior, Jesus Christ? So that's where we'll go during the study this morning. Again, this is a case study from the scriptures that illustrates more of what we learned last week. Well, let's go to the Old Testament and learn more about two of God's servants named Mordecai and Esther. And if you look at the slide titled Mordecai and Esther, you can see that it is chapters 4 and 5 that draw our attention today. Esther 4 and 5 tell us how Mordecai and Esther identified, limited, and managed stressors in their lives, and with the Lord's help, they served both God and his people. I'm not sure how familiar you are with the book of Esther. It's not quite as familiar as the account we looked at two weeks ago of David and his infant son who perished following his uh, incident with Bathsheba. Uh, this is a less familiar part of the Bible, and it's strange in that the book of Esther is the only book in the Bible in which God is not mentioned by name. Now, some have said, well, this shows that the book of Esther doesn't belong in the Bible, but there's another way to look at this book, and I think it's the way that most of us as Christians read Esther. In other words, it's a literary device. It's a tool that the author of Esther used. Even though he didn't mention God by name, you cannot help but see God's hand at work in the book. Even if he's not mentioned by name, God orchestrates things according to his divine, eternal plan for the well-being of his people. And we will see that in the book of Esther as we study today. So there's value for us, uh, as we go to the next slide, prepared to serve. There's value for us in knowing that God's people throughout history have used their vocations to serve him. We're going to learn a lot about Mordecai and Esther today, and by learning to identify limit and manage our stress, we can be prepared to serve our Lord and his people in our vocations. Again, if you're watching on Facebook Live, just log on and give a shout. Tell everybody that you're out there, even if you don't have a question or a comment, that helps expand our metric on Facebook. If you know what that means, you're more knowledgeable than I. And speaking of someone who is much more knowledgeable than I about matters of technology, we have Vicar Brett Jones with us this morning. Welcome, Vicar Brett. And uh, uh, you're going to lead us through now some of this case study 
on Mordecai and Esther. Tell us more. Indeed. So as you stated, this book isn't as familiar to many of us as the account that we went through last time. And you've heard pastors say the names Esther and Mordecai over and over again. Well, we're going to get to who they, who they are specifically in just a moment. But before we do that, let's get a little bit of background information as to why this is taking place in the Persian kingdom. And that if you look on the slide, uh, the Jews from the tribe of Benjamin were living in Susa, the capital of the Persians. These, these Jews were descended from the Judahites who were exiled to Babylon under King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, as you see toward the end of the story, the, these Jews in Susa are critical to the end of the story, but there are also Jews living in pockets throughout the kingdom. So they are not just the only ones who, are, who have been exiled. Now let's take a look at who Mordecai and Esther were. Because this helping to, knowing their relationship is gonna help you understand the story as we go on. So Mordecai was an official in the administration of the Persian king Ahasuerus. Now we don't know exactly what his position was. We do know that uh, he was a fairly high level official and that he would have access to at least be around the the temple. I'm sorry, the, uh, the uh, Palace. Palace, thank you. See, that's yes, why we do word, this team teaching. The word we can I am looking out. for, yes, palace. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, we know that Esther was Mordecai's cousin, and she was an orphan, uh, and Mordecai became her guardian. As is sometimes the case with cousins, there is a, a vast age difference, and uh, it, is, it is the case that Mordecai was much older than Esther was, and their relationship was really less of that of a typical kind of what you would picture as a cousin relationship and more of a father-daughter relationship and that he was her guardian and, and he raised her as his daughter. Yeah, it, I think it even says that in chapter 2 verse 7 it mentions that and, and I was I have to admit I wasn't clear on their relationship I was thinking that Mordecai was her uncle um, it does say that if you trace out the family tree she, they are first cousins but as you say, the relationship is, is of a, almost like a different generation. It's as though he were an uncle who adopted her. And as you point out, this happens even today in some of the families that we've known and worked with where uh, for whatever reason, uh, parents are deceased or are unable to care for a child for some reason and um, a family member acts as guardian or maybe even legally adopts someone as a son or daughter. And it seems like that's what Mordecai was doing here. Yes. And finally, the, the last thing to note about Esther before we get started is that she is extremely beautiful. And, and while uh, you may be thinking to yourself, what, what does this have to do with anything? Um, it does play a critical role in, in the story. So with that, I'll hand it back yeah. over to Pastor. Yeah, and I would, I would say, um, you know, at the risk of the two of us coming across as male chauvinists here, um, you know, when you say beautiful, uh, not just physically attractive, which it seems Esther was, but uh, she is certainly intelligent, smart, clever, creative, bold, and beautiful in the sense of, for example, that wise woman who's uh, described at the end of the book of Proverbs, uh, beautiful in the biblical sense, right? A well-rounded human being uh, in every way and positioned at just the right place in just the right time as God would have her. And her uh, savviness is going to come into yes. play several times yes. throughout this narrative. Yeah. Okay, well, let's uh, talk just briefly again about the book of Esther. Uh, it concerns the rescue of God's people, the Jews in Persia. Uh, Vicar Brett mentioned that these people were numerous and scattered throughout the Persian Empire, which was the greatest empire in the world of that day. You remember how they got to Persia in the first place. They were exiled by the Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar. And we've been learning a lot about that on Tuesday morning in our Bible study on the book of Daniel. Uh, you will recall that after Nebuchadnezzar's reign, there were a series of lesser kings uh, whose uh, end came with our man Belshazzar, whom we learned a lot about in our Daniel study, and then the Medes and the Persians took over. And uh, that's the empire that is around during the book of Esther. So we're looking at, oh, somewhere about 475 years or so before the birth of Christ. 
And the question then, uh, because uh, God's name is not mentioned in the book of Esther, is God present? And I've already said yes. This is a device that the author of the book of Esther uses to show that it must be the Lord God who saved the Jews. And one of the things that will come across in this study is how significant the danger is, not just to Mordecai and Esther and a few people in the palace who get caught up in court intrigue. This happens in the scriptures again and again and again. But you're talking about an entire nation of people, an entire race of people scattered throughout the Persian Empire. And uh, as we will see, there is a real risk of what we would call today an ethnic cleansing or a genocide. And what a horrible tragedy this would be uh, if it were allowed to play out. But we're gonna find out more about that. And so uh, let's go back to Vicar Brett and he'll tell us more about the case study. And uh, we talked earlier in the week about how you really have to do more background because I think a lot of us just aren't familiar with this. So we're gonna try to keep a balance between being thorough but being brief at the same time, right? Go right ahead. Indeed, so most, most of what we're going to focus on takes place in chapters 4 and 5 in Esther. But in order to really understand what's going on, we're going to kind of walk through chapters 1 through 3. So in just a second, uh, Mr. Whitmayer is going to advance the slide, and it's going to have the various headings from the English Standard Version of the Bible. So if you were reading this, these are kind of like the paragraphs throughout the chapter. And if you're using an NIV Bible or a different version of the Bible, that's fine, but they won't match up quite right, and that's okay. So we'll walk through each of those and then we'll deep dive into chapters 4 and 5. So the king of Persia, as we said earlier, his name was Ahasuerus, he brought in nobles and officials from his armies from all around Persia. Uh, he held a great feast. Uh, part of the reason was to show off his wealth. You can think kind of in modern terms like a state dinner at the White House uh, where all, with all the pomp and circumstance that that involves. And uh, this is something that's gone on since basically the beginning of time. And the food and the drinks flowed over the course of seven days. And there was, there was much eating and, and quite a bit of alcohol consumed at this, at this event. And in part of the drinking, uh, the king asked for his queen, Queen Vashti, to be brought in front of the banquet uh, for she was also quite beautiful. Now we don't know much about her except that she was strong-willed enough to refuse this order as it seemed she didn't want to be paraded around in front of a, dr a bunch of drunken men. And this, as you would imagine, angered the king and he banished the queen and sent out a royal decree to start a search for a new wife. So the king sent for beautiful virgins to be brought before him so that he could choose a new queen. Esther, who was, as we had talked about before, was a Jewish woman living with Mordecai. Uh, she was quite beautiful, as we had talked about in chapter 2, verse 7, and she was taken, taken into custody to take part in this beauty contest. When uh, the contest occurred, the king chose Esther to be his new queen. As this was happening, Mordecai was outside the palace at the gates. He heard two eunuchs discussing a plot to overthrow King Ahasuerus. Mordecai then told this to Esther, and Esther then relayed this to the king. The king then investigated the plot, found that it was true, executed the men responsible, and then this was written down in his chronicles. It, this was a record of all of the important things that had happened during the reign of the king. And let's remember for just a second that in this period in history, to be able to read and write was not a common thing. So this would have been a special recognition to be recorded in writing in the, in the king's scrolls. After this happened, a man named Haman was promoted, and uh, he asked that people bow down to him. Mordecai refused to do this because he saw it as a violation of the first commandment, that he would bow to no one but God. This angered Haman, and he got so angry that he not only retaliated against Mordecai, but also decided that he was going to exact revenge on his people as well. So. 
Okay, yeah, there's a lot of stuff there in those first three chapters, isn't there? So let's just take a, a quick uh, review of what uh, Vicar Brett had said. You have the Persians who seem to be uh, rather open-minded as conquering empires go, and uh, Ahasuerus was willing not only to consider a foreign woman as his queen, but to choose Esther. And you see how uh, God positioned her in this vocation now as queen. And then Mordecai, who was privy to this plot and demonstrated a loyalty to the king, despite the fact that he's not from the same nationality or people group. Uh, and so working together, Mordecai and Esther, in effect, saved the king's life, right? And this is written down, which becomes important later on. Ahasuerus has it recorded in his memoirs or his chronicles, however you want to say it. And uh, he is quite grateful to Mordecai and to Esther for this act of bravery on their part. But it doesn't please everybody, and so Haman, this... Uh, by all accounts, wicked man of the Persians uh, comes up with his plot to do away not only with these two, but with the entire Jewish race. And so that's where we pick up then in chapter 4. Now this is where we'll start reading verse by verse, and uh, the theme for these first verses is identify. This was the first verb in our study last week in terms of dealing with our stress and being prepared to serve. As we read Esther 4, 1 through 11, see if you can identify the stressors that Mordecai and Esther faced. Try to put yourself in their shoes and ask yourself, how are their stressors similar to yours? Again, if you had any comments or questions, you can submit them on Facebook. Mr. Whitmere is in the balcony running the electronics and he'll be able to relay them to us. And so if he has something uh, to share with us, he'll let us know. Uh, but for now, we're going to the text of the book of Esther in chapter four. Let's have Vicar Brett read for us verses one through 11. Okay. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city, and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. And in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, there was a great mourning among the Jews, with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and many of them lay, sackcloth, lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's young women and her eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called for Hathach, one of the king's eunuchs, to be a, who had been appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what this was and why it was. Hathach went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her, and command her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. And Hathach went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hathach and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king these 30 days. All right. Well, thank you, Vicar Brett. And there's a lot there in those first 11 verses. Now, we said before that Mordecai had been placed in this position as some sort of official in the uh, palace of King Ahasuerus of the Persians. And if you think about what stressor does he face now, I'd ask you to think of a big picture stressor. For uh, Mordecai, I think the thing that bothered him the most or that was front and center in his mind was Haman's plot to destroy all the Jews in Persia. Uh, he recognized that this put the lives of thousands, tens of thousands of people at risk. 
And uh, you can see that uh, Haman was devious enough to promise the king that he would pay into the king's treasury if the king would agree to do this. So it's an insidious plot. It's a big plot. It's a big picture stressor that Mordecai identified in his life. If you're thinking about the question at the bottom of this slide on identify, how are these stressors similar to yours? I might ask you to consider some of the big picture stressors that are occurring right now. And these are the things that we've already talked about today. And I mentioned the three of them, the pandemic, social unrest in our culture, and the upcoming elections. Those are big things, aren't they? They are things that for one person can easily become overwhelming. What can I do? I can't do anything. Where do I turn? It seems like there's nowhere to go for help. So this is what Mordecai is facing. Now, if you keep reading in these first 11 verses, you get down to Esther, and Esther's stress, I would submit, is of a different kind. It's more focused. It's unique. The stressor that Esther faced was hers and hers alone. Why? Because she's only one queen. I mean, she's the only queen. And so she was now called upon to go and approach the king and ask for his help in rescinding this order. But she knew that in doing so, she was risking her own life. And besides, she hadn't been called before him in 30 days. This is not something that anyone else in the empire would have faced as a stressor. It was unique to Esther. If you think of your own life, think of the things that you face in your job, in your schoolwork, in your relationship with somebody else, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, parent, child. Whatever it is, can be a stressor unique to you. Nobody else faces it. No one else has to deal with it the way that you do. In that way, perhaps, Esther's stressor is similar to yours. And before we go on to the next um, section of uh, Esther, I'm just going to throw it back over to Vicar Brett. Any comments or uh, thoughts that you had on the difference between the big picture stressor that it seems like there's nothing we can do anything about and then those more narrowly focused stressors that we know are ours and ours alone yeah those sort of acute those sort of uh, acute stressors really uh, make it worse you know when you think of all these general things going on many of us can deal with that on a it, it still stresses us out but these acute stressors then put us in a point where it can become overwhelming and especially we may not always be able to know who we can turn to and then that can actually reinforce the stress going on as well. Do you find also that it seems like the weight of the world is on your shoulders? Um, you know you think about uh, you were mentioning the vice presidential debate this week. You know, you've got the vice presidential debate, and it's going to go back and forth. There's not a lot an individual citizen is going to be able to do to influence the result of a vice presidential debate. That's kind of a big picture thing, and if you watch it, you might get stressed out. But if you've got a math exam coming up tomorrow morning, and you know that your grade depends on that and your grade point average is right on the bubble of trying to get into a college that you really want to attend or qualify for a scholarship or something like that, that's a lot of stress yeah. on you. And, 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 and sometimes and, those larger picture stressors can become those focused ones. You can think about the, the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, it's one thing when you're thinking about it at a general societal level, it's kind of like the vice presidential debate, you said, you know, there's not much we can do about it, but then all of a sudden someone you know, someone dear to you is now sick and perhaps in the, in the hospital, now that's a very different stress yeah. and, that, and the two can interact. Yeah. yeah, that's true. So that's how we identify our stressors. We're going to transition now to the next of the three uh, verbs in this study. And that's the verb limit. And uh, as we read the next verses of Esther chapter 4, 
I'm going to try to look at how Mordecai and Esther limited or at least focused the stress that they faced. Again, try to put yourself in their shoes if you can. Go back to ancient Persia. Persia. Imagine that you are a Jewish man who is a, an exile in a foreign country and yet serving the king of that nation, trying to do so faithfully and knowing that that king is about to sign an order condemning your entire people to execution at the hands of this wicked man. Uh, you talk about a stressor. How about Haman? <laughs> He's putting a lot of stress on Mordecai and the Jews. Or Esther, uh, preparing yourself. What am I going to wear? How am I going to style my hair? What am I going to say when I approach the king? I got to make sure that I don't make any breach of protocol that would cause him to send me away. Um, it reminds me a little bit, uh, every so often the British seem to have these royal weddings that we get so fascinated about. And you know, uh, the last one I think was, what, Prince Harry and, and Meghan Markle? Mm -hmm. And uh, you talk to these, these people who go through the protocol, and British people are just fascinated with protocol and, and all of this. And you have to imagine that Esther was required to do the same thing in uh, ancient Persia. So how does she focus her attention and her concentration to limit her stress in this way? And uh, let's go back to Vicar Brett now, and he's going to read for us in Esther chapter 4, verses 12 yeah. through 14. Before we do that, though, let's consider the stakes, too. I mean, with your example of a British wedding, yeah. if someone does something wrong, a spear is not going to fly out of the castle. One would hope. <laughs> right. Queen Elizabeth with her spear, right? <laughs> you did it wrong! Uh, no, you're right. It, it right. wouldn't happen that way. But here... Right. The stakes are high for Esther. So everything that she is doing, like you said, is, is very carefully thought through. So let's begin. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther... Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. All right. I think that verse uh, 14 is probably the most important verse in the book of Esther. It's a strange verse, but it's the clearest um, expression of acknowledgement of not only a God, but the God of the Jews, whom we know as Yahweh, the Lord God, the one true God revealed in the scriptures, who later manifests himself in the person of Jesus Christ. Now you might say, well, pastor, that's a big stretch to get out of Esther 4, verse 14. But I think if you think through who Mordecai was, and what his faith in the Lord God was and how he was using his vocation, he is limiting his stress to what is most important here. Um, I'm not sure if Mr. Whitmer is showing that slide. Um, I found this picture that I put up for the reading of uh, chapter 4, verses 12 to 14. There's a little bit of agitation in the discussion, isn't there? Let us not presume that stress didn't affect these two. And if you look at uh, Mordecai, he's got the decree in his hand and his hands are outstretched and he's, he is um, almost berating his young uh, ward there, his cousin who he's raising as a daughter. Don't you know what's happening? Uh, don't you think that you're going to escape this just because you're the queen? For you're a Jew too, and you're going to fall under the same judgment as the rest of us. And then you you got to love uh, Esther with that distracted look. I, I have three uh, daughters, and uh, I'm familiar with that look, the looking away like you have no idea what I'm going through. You don't understand me at all. Uh, don't you realize what I'm about to do here or what you're asking me to do? So Mordecai recognized... Uh, we go to the limit slides now. Mordecai recognized Esther as an ace in the hole, you might say. He's got one chance for the Jews to be saved. Esther may have been reluctant to act and tempted to keep silent, but he reminded her, who knows, this may be your time, your opportunity, their one and only chance. That's the focus or the limiting. This is it right here. 
We've got this opportunity because the Lord God has placed you. He's prepared you your whole life for this moment when you can go before the king because now you're the queen and you have the opportunity to do something nobody else can. He has prepared you to serve in this way. So it reminds me a little bit of a uh, speech that a football coach might make before uh, the Super Bowl. Or uh, I know you're a, uh, you're a Green Bay guy too, and if you remember back, um, oh, this is a long time ago now, but um, the uh, Super Bowl, the Packers won in the 1990s. Mike Holmgren was their coach, and I remember the video after the Super Bowl, and um, it was stunning, the speech that Mike Holmgren made to the team before they took the field in that Super Bowl. Um, he said something very similar to that. Your whole life you've been preparing yourself for this game, this moment. This is when you can make it all happen. And I thought of that speech as I uh, thought about Mordecai here. Now, um, if we go to the next limit slide, notice that Mordecai had a broader perspective. Um, he understood that while he and Esther were limited, God was not. And that even if this plan, the only thing they could do, even if that failed, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. So he did have faith in the Lord God of the Jews, but he was limiting himself to what he could control and focus in this spot, right? Indeed. Okay, anything else on that one? Otherwise, our, our time is uh, fast fleeting, so let us move on then. And the third of the three verbs in this section, in this case study, is manage. Now we're going to see how they put into practice the things that they had proposed to do. How did they manage the stress they face? Again, try to put yourself in their shoes. You know, what can you do and then how are you going to do it as you manage your stress? Again, if you want to make a comment or ask a question on Facebook, please feel free to do that. Mr. Whitmayer will relay those to us. But uh, since I don't see him waving his arms up there in the balcony, frantically trying to get our attention, we will move on and finish today's Bible reading from Esther 4, verse 15 to 5, verse 8. And Vicar Brett will read us that section. Okay. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf, and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace, in front of the king's quarters, while the king was sitting on his royal throne inside the throne room opposite the entrance to the palace. And when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she won favor in his sight, and he held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter, and the king said to her, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given to you even to the half of my kingdom. And Esther said, If it please the king, let the king and Haman come today to a feast that I have prepared for the king. Then the king said, Bring Haman quickly, so that we may do as Esther has asked. So the king and Haman came to the feast that Esther had prepared. And as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king said to Esther, What is your wish? It shall be granted to you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom it shall be fulfilled. Then Esther answered, My wish and my request is, If I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my wish and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come to the feast that I will prepare for them, and tomorrow I will do as the king has said. Now, thank you for reading that. Um, you might think that's a strange place to end the reading, and it is. Uh, I'll acknowledge that, but uh, we do this more in the interest of time. We just don't have time in the hour we have to go through the whole book, but I thought it was a good place to stop for a couple of reasons, because it is showing you how Esther is using her God-given gifts and abilities to manage the situation, to turn what was a very stressful event for herself into something that if she's not in charge of it, she's certainly uh, turning the tables a bit. 
First of all, what did she do? She managed her stress by calling for a fast. She said, I will do this, and I ask all the people to do it too. I think there's an implication there that they're trusting in the Lord God. Fasting was done for religious reasons, as a way of humbling oneself before the Lord, asking his blessings, seeking his will. And then she said, I'll go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. This is not a fatalistic uh, wish that Esther has, that she's wishing her own demise but she is placing herself in the Lord's hands. And whatever his will is, let that be done. And I think that's a good way, again, of managing our stress. You know, whatever it is, we'll make a decision that is to the best of our ability, and we place the outcome in the Lord's hands. And maybe it will turn out the way we hope, and maybe it won't, but let his will be done. There is a note in the Lutheran Study Bible on page 767. These oft-quoted words show Esther's faith, courage, and humility. Now, uh, as we keep going uh, through these verses, we see that Esther was prepared to serve by being willing to lay down her life in hopes of saving her people. She understood the risk that she might be put to death for her breach of protocol in approaching the king, and yet she was willing to do it because she understood that she was the only one, at least humanly speaking, who had a chance to save the Jews. How can you do the same in your vocations? Well, hopefully you're not going to be in the position of approaching a king and preventing a genocide. But think about how you can use the gifts, the abilities, the preparations that God has made in you to serve him and his people, even if it's someone in your own family. Let's talk about Mordecai. How did he manage his stress? Well, <laughs> he had to place the matter in the hands of his young cousin. Uh, some of us have a hard time delegating responsibility. We'd rather do it ourselves. Uh, Mordecai realized there's no way he was going to approach the king, so he had a trust that Esther would do all right. And in verse 17, you'll notice, I love verse 17, because doesn't it say she did everything, or he did everything that the queen told him to do? Right? That's a bit of a stretch there uh, for the man who had raised this young woman as his own daughter. Now he submits to her and says, I will do whatever the queen says. And so he does. Think about in your serving, in your vocations, how you can do the same, how you can submit yourself to the will of those around you and uh, serve as Christ did, laying down your life. Uh, to, uh, uh, for their benefit. Okay, um, I want to talk about the result. Now, we talked about Esther turning the tables a bit, and Vicar, maybe you can uh, explain a little bit more about the result and how Esther created this drama or suspense in these last verses. She doesn't really come right out and say, hey, I think we should overturn this decree. What did she do instead? Right, and this is where we kind of briefly talked about her savvy in that she is not just going to, like you said, say, I'm going to reverse this decree. She is putting the things in motion so that the king, and the king ends up seeing what is going on. So she ends up putting all of you might say, the pawns in place on the chessboard. Yeah. And whom did she invite to the banquet? Not just yes. the king, but, oh, but Haman. Is, Haman. Yes, Haman. And what's is the there. old adage? Keep yeah. your friends close, but your, your enemies, enemies closer. Close. Indeed. And not just once, but twice she invited this wicked man to their dinners. Yes, and it will come that this is and ends up being the way that the king discovers everything that's, that's going on. So she ends up by arranging all of this to put Haman in a position where he is about to take the fall and where Mordecai is going to be given hope in what is to come. Uh, yeah. Very good. Uh, our time is running short, so let's keep going on the result. Uh, Mordecai and Esther were in positions they never could have orchestrated for themselves. We have to see the hand of God working in their lives. They allowed the Lord God to work in ways they could not have done on their own. They were prepared to serve. And you can think about your vocations, whether they're in the home as husband, wife, parent, child. 
uh, in your workplace as a manager or employer or as an employee or a worker, in school as a student, perhaps you're a teacher in a school, in society as a citizen voting, uh, participating in community life. How are you prepared to serve? And then we'll go to the result, and you can take us through quickly the rest of the book of Esther. And I might suggest that our uh, uh, Bible study participants, you want, just go back and read this for yourself, because we can't do justice here in the time. But maybe you can give us the outline of what happened next. So Haman leaves the feast joyful, but then he sees Mordecai at the gate, and uh, he's enraged by seeing Mordecai. Uh, he bragged about all of the riches that he had to the people around him, but then he said that these would be nothing unless Mordecai was killed. So his wife and his friends suggested to him to make the gallows to prepare to hang Mordecai, and Haman ordered it done. Uh, later on, the king couldn't sleep, so this book of Chronicles that the pastor had talked about again, he had that read to him, and he remembered Mordecai and how he had helped 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 the, stop the assassination plot against him. Uh, the king says that he wants to honor someone and he calls Haman into his court in order to set this up and Haman is probably expecting to be honored himself but instead of Haman it's Mordecai that he wants honored. So of course um, Haman does not defy the king but he does go with his wife and friends and commiserate, his, uh, commiserate this, this occurrence. So Esther reveals Haman's plot at, a, at one of the festivals because the king asks if she had a request and she asked that her people not be destroyed. And then when the king asked who arranged this, this terrible plot that, that could destroy all the people of the queen, Esther reveals it to be Haman. So the king got up, he was he was quite angry and likely drunk and found Haman on the couch. He was also likely drunk and probably even passed out. He confronted Haman and then one of the eunuchs stated that Haman already had gallows prepared and this seemed to be quite convenient for the king. So the king ordered Haman to be hung on the very gallows that Haman had created to hang Mordecai on. So uh, this this not only allowed the Jews to survive, but then uh, the king not only revoked the order that, that, that allowed them to be destroyed, but the king also allowed the Jews to defend themselves. Uh, so he sent this out to the entire kingdom, and all of the Jews throughout the kingdom rejoiced. Uh, the Jews then, on the day in which they were to be destroyed, they took up arms against their enemies, and upon hearing the reports of the violence, the king asked Esther what she would like to be done about the situation. Esther asked for the Jews to be able to continue to defend themselves, and the king agreed, and then the ten sons of Haman were also hanged. And finally, Mordecai recorded these events and sent letters to all the Jews in the kingdom that told them to remember this day. Uh, then Queen Esther and Mordecai gave authority for this two-day holiday to be celebrated throughout the kingdom, and they sent a second letter with the official notification that this was indeed a holiday to be celebrated every year. And then finally, uh, the king promoted Mordecai to second in rank to only himself, and he was great among the Jews and popular with the multitude of his brothers because he sought for his people and spoke peace to all of his people. Very good. Yeah, that's a, a quick wrap-up of the closing chapters of the book of Esther. The feast is called Purim. Uh, if you know, uh, have friends or uh, colleagues who uh, are practicing Judaism, uh, Purim is still celebrated today among the Jews all over the world. And on that day, the book of Esther is read. So we see again, uh, as we uh, prepare to uh, wrap up, prepared to serve, Mordecai used his vocation as Esther's guardian to mentor her, both politically in the ways of the court of the Persians, but also spiritually in the ways of the Lord God himself. Esther used her vocation as queen to allow the king to punish Haman and honor Mordecai. 
And I know uh, most of the time when people use the word irony, uh, they use it incorrectly, but here is one use of the word irony that is spot on. As you rightly pointed out, the gallows that Haman had constructed for the purpose of hanging Mordecai was used instead to hang Haman. Through Esther and Mordecai, God spared the Jews in Persia. And this is a great example of his salvation. Now, as Christians, we read this with a view toward the fulfillment of God's redeeming grace in Christ Jesus. And we see in the work of Mordecai and Esther a glimpse of a greater redemption that Jesus will accomplish on the cross and in his resurrection from the dead saving not just Jewish people from destruction, but saving the whole human race from sin, death, and the devil. And now our Lord Jesus says that all who believe in him, Jew or Gentile, even Persians, you might say, right, can be saved through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. As we wrap up our lesson today, ask yourself this question, how can the Lord use you in your vocation to serve his people and witness your faith in the Savior Jesus Christ as he did for Mordecai and Esther. Well, we are just about out of time today. I want to thank uh, Vicar Brett Jones for being with me today. Thank you for uh, sharing this case study with me. And uh, any final thoughts that you might have today? I just thank you for the opportunity to be here. It's a pleasure. Okay. We also thank Mr. John Whitmere in the balcony, who is our electronics uh, guru, you might say, up there. And he's been uh, helping uh, put a lot of our material online, Bible studies, devotions, chapels, and so on. Again, we thank Mr. Whitmere for all of his work on behalf of our congregation. And for those of you who are watching at home over Facebook or listening to the audio stream on the telephone ministry, we thank you for joining us this morning for our Sunday Bible study. Next week, we'll continue this look at stress and worry in the life of a Christian. We'll have another one of those lessons from Lutheran Hour Ministries, and we'll uh, spend some time again with Dr. Rick Mars. So that will be next Sunday morning, and that's the 18th of October, I believe, at 9.20 a.m. Central Daylight Time. Let's close with the benediction of our Lord, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Thanks again for joining us today. We'll look forward to seeing you again next time.